Now, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, a scholar who is relatively new to the university, but who is definitely not new to research. So Dr. Mark Schliesel graduated from Princeton University with a bachelor's degree in biochemical sciences. He earned his MD and PhD degrees at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He did his residence training also at Hopkins and then conducted postdoctoral research training in MIT. After serving on the faculty at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Shizou moved to the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California, Berkeley, where he rose to the rank of full professor and then the position of Dean of Biological Sciences in the College of Letters and Science. A leading researcher in developmental biology, he is the author or co-author of more than 100 papers and has trained uh, 21 PhD graduates. After three years at Brown University as his provost, Dr. Schlitzel became the president of the University of Michigan on July 14th. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our keynote speaker, President Schlitzel. Hi, good morning everybody, and thanks to Vice President Yu for this kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here to celebrate the success of M-Cubed and the researchers and the students who brought this exciting new dimension to discovery at the University of Michigan. Uh, when I first heard about this idea, I didn't understand it. Then, when I learned about this system of tokens and giving away seed funds without review, I said, why, my goodness, why on earth would you do that? And then I thought a little about it, and I thought it was the most clever idea and novel approach to stimulating interdisciplinary research on the investigator level that I had heard. Uh, we are doing peer review because you're all faculty members at this great university. Uh, lowering the threshold for people to try ideas and to try ideas in a collaborative sense uh, was, was simply brilliant. And the notion that Everyone has skin in the game so that these ideas aren't trivial ideas, they're thoughtful, so money comes from the provost, it comes from the, the deans and chairs and from the investigators themselves. People are voting with their resources. Everybody feels like they're leveraging their investment. Uh, so I really think it's brilliant, and I'm gonna advertise this so that our peer institutions, you know, some would say our competitor institutions, actually take advantage of this great idea because we're all in it for the betterment of society. So I really congratulate the clever and creative people that thought of this idea uh, and uh, those of you that participated in it. I especially want to thank Provost Pollock and the schools and colleges and external groups that have given their support to M-Cubed, along with Mark Burns and the entire M-Cubed team. So congratulations as well uh, on uh, now M-Cubed 2.0 as we run out of funny terms to use in, in speaking about our creative efforts here. Uh, the enterprise of research at a place like the University of Michigan must be innovative and forward-looking, and M-Cubed has certainly blazed a new trail in this regard. Achievements in a relatively short period of time are just remarkable. Uh, as Jack said, the initiative drew about 700 faculty members from 25 campus units, including all of our schools and colleges. The cubes attracted faculty of all ranks with a representative distribution across the university by gender and many other dimensions. And I've heard that from the deans that M-Cubed has already been successful as a tool to recruit new faculty. M-Cubed was successful in terms of productivity as well. The cubes have already secured $20 million in external funds, and I heard about even more this morning, while generating now 39 publications and dozens of works and another 42 scholarly and creative products. Uh, this is uh, just the beginning. It'll take years for this first year of investment to really uh, play out. So the early uh, success in, in measurable metrics is pretty exciting. So all of you have my congratulations for your success. Thank you. As a physician scientist, I appreciate these accomplishments, and they take me back to the various stages in my own career as a scientist, a teacher, a department chair, a dean, a provost, and now a president. My first experience in the research world was volunteering to work in a lab at Princeton where I was an undergraduate student. I took photographs of chromosome preparations that my mentor used in his efforts to map genes onto individual human chromosomes. 
I began college program from childhood to become a medical doctor. I viewed my early efforts in the lab as one of the things you're supposed to do to get into medical school. The problem, at least according to my parents, was that I fell in love with laboratory science. I found it intoxicating to work with my own hands to generate data that people could argue about leading to new knowledge and increasing levels of understanding about how life worked. That passion is ultimately what led me to pursue an MD-PhD uh, training program for almost seven years at Johns Hopkins, funded by the NIH's Medical Scientist Training Program. And it's remained with me uh, over the ensuing decades. I went on to do a residency in internal medicine at Hopkins, followed by a postdoc at MIT in, at the Whitehead Institute in David Baltimore's lab, where I began my studies of the developmental biology of the immune system, a topic I continued to work on for over 20 years. I began my independent career as an assistant professor back at Hopkins where I had trained. I'll never forget the stark difference between my first weeks and months on the faculty when measured against my time as a graduate student or postdoc. In that work, I was often immersed in large groups of students and mentors, lab partners, and senior faculty. Suddenly, as a brand new assistant professor, I was alone. A big, newly renovated laboratory at a great institution with a modest amount of startup funding as dowry. Despite having prepared for that moment for more than a decade, there was still so much to learn, including how to secure funding, how to recruit, how to hire and supervise and mentor students and staff, how to be a good teacher, and how to reach out to develop appropriate collaborations both in my own institution and around the country and world. It was both daunting and exhilarating, and it's a set of experiences that I've held closely as I've accepted successively greater leadership roles in the academy. Now as president, I'm actually applying these lessons every day. I want Michigan to be a place where faculty believe they can do their best work, where they can fulfill their ambitions as scholars, as researchers and teachers, where students can learn from the very best professors and be involved in their quest for new knowledge and understanding. I want Michigan to aspire to conduct research at the highest levels for the benefit of society and to be known as the best public institution for discovery in the world. One of my most important duties is working with faculty to make this happen. I've spent the last three months getting to know the University of Michigan and it's clear that taken as a whole, the breadth of excellence here is almost unmatched in the academy. From architecture and urban design to social work and with our 17 other schools and colleges in between, with an alphabet soup of renowned institutes like LSI, ISR, IHPI, I'm still learning, we can boast 100 graduate and professional programs ranked in the top 10 in their fields. At the same time, the depth and impact of the research we do is breathtaking. Provost Pollock and I were privileged earlier this week to honor 26 colleagues on the faculty uh, at the faculty awards dinner. The awards recognized everything from dance to robotics. And collectively, the University of Michigan's contributions to discovery and understanding are extraordinary. Also Monday, we announced that the university set a new re annual record for tech transfer, including inventions, agreements, and startups. Uh, the breadth and level of impact have confirmed to me the potential here at the University of Michigan is as promising as I thought it was when I accepted this fantastic job. And that potential is what excites me the most. It's the potential for synergy across so many units and the ability to work together in ways that no in other institution can really do. It's the potential to take on the biggest problems in society and bring the full weight of our intellectual capacities to bear on issues that affect lives in our communities and across the globe. What I would like to do as president in the months and years ahead is to work with you to figure out how to fully tap into this comprehensive excellence and realize the potential of strategic synergy across the full breadth of the institution. When it comes to academic strategy, our 19 schools and colleges often function as independent pillars of excellence. 
which undoubtedly have strengthened the university, but also leave greater potential for collaboration. Our individual faculty can and do find collaborators on campus regardless of their departmental affiliation. About 15% of the research proposals submitted at the University of Michigan involve more than one of our schools or colleges. And over 40% involve more than one principal investigator. We are truly a collaborative community. There's a lot of great work that comes out of these collaborations. M cubed, of course, is one great example, and I know there are others, such as the Mobility Transformation Center that the Vice President mentioned, and the effort that saved the life of an infant through implantation of a tracheal splint produced on a 3D printer. These are fantastic, and they reflect the remarkable collaborative ethos among our faculty here. I want to take this to a higher level, beyond the level of individual collaborative projects, to the level of strategic synergy amongst our schools and colleges and institutes. This doesn't mean giving up the entrepreneurial spirit that's created the breadth of excellence of our 19 schools and colleges. It means asking how can we provide schools and colleges with the right resources and tools to plan together so that their investments in infrastructure, in faculty, in programs are purposefully complementary. In other words, how do we make the strength greater than the sum of our many excellent parts? There are very few big problems in this world that can be solved by single disciplines. And when our faculty aspire to take them on, I want them to have the intellectual environment as well as the freedom and the support necessary to achieve those ambitions. We certainly have the talent and track record to do that. With our 200 year history as a public institution, our steady flow of talented students, and our assembled breadth of influential and comprehensive excellence, we're uniquely qualified and I believe empowered to solve these big problems. There's simply no university better suited to advance the highest ideals of what a public research university should be. I'm excited to begin the first exploration into this area today as this initial step will involve the life sciences. I'm pleased to announce that I'm convening a president's advisory panel on the biosciences. The panel is charged with developing and recommending a strategy that will propel Michigan to the forefront in life science research by optimally leveraging our comprehensive excellence. This is a big job, made no less difficult because we're a big place. So getting the right people in the room is actually important, most important. I've invited a small group of leading faculty from the life sciences and fields associated now with biological discovery to serve on this panel. It'll be led by Provost Pollock and all of the faculty members involved are top researchers and thought leaders in their disciplines. The names of the panelists and my charge to them will be posted on my website. Like I said before, I know from personal experience that faculty members have a close familiarity with the challenges facing the research enterprise. I specifically wanted faculty to have the dominant voice in this effort. The work comes at a critical moment for society. The biosciences have become a fundamental target of discovery in many fields, once quite distant from biology, both here at the University of Michigan and across the world. Engineers, chemists, physicists, computer scientists, mathematicians, and others are helping unravel the fundamental secrets of life and contributing to the development of treatments for disease. Social, environmental, and public health research is teasing apart the many and varied influences that have impacts on life science at levels that range from the biology of living cells to the quality of human life. This form of scientific research certainly looks much different than it did when I started my lab at Hopkins over 20 years ago. The environment in which this work takes place is also very different. The Biomedical Research Symposium that was part of my inauguration in early September set forth a major challenge confronting the life sciences that we must solve in order to assure Michigan's future as a global leader in this important area of research. It's an additional challenge that makes the panel's work even more timely and even more important. 
there's a basic and systematic mismatch between supply and demand. The number of researchers and trainees exceeds the amount of resources available to so sustain their careers and robust biological research enterprise. Harold Varmus, who led the discussion, called it a Malthusian dilemma because the number of doctoral graduates we're producing is growing exponentially while the resources available to perform research are barely growing at all. At the same time, we're seeing greater international competition. This has led success rates to fall sharply for NIH grant applicants, and the system as we know it is no longer adequately supportive of the very best science. I'm asking members of the new panel to examine these external challenges and any internal factors that could hold us back while seeking to determine how we can best leverage our strengths. It will look at issues such as synergistic investments across schools and colleges in building, recruiting faculty, equipping, and in hiring. It will work to unite our system, remove barriers, and minimize redundancies so we can become a more strategically coherent institution. The panel has its work cut out for it, but the benefits could be tremendous. Imagine, for example, if our schools of medicine, engineering, information, letter science and the arts, and pharmacy teamed up with the Institute for Social Research and the School of Public Health and focused their collective power on a single problem like controlling the local and global spread of emerging infectious diseases like Ebola in nations with limited infrastructure. All of society would benefit. Those potential benefits is why I'm open to any ideas from the panel. They can be novel or dare I say even radical. I'm sure that M cubed may have just begun as a wild idea at some point and look at how it's grown into something much larger in such a short period of time. I've promised to consider each recommendation from the panel, and I look forward to doing so. Final recommendations are scheduled for the end of the 2015 academic, uh, uh, winter semester academic year. I felt it was appropriate to make this announcement at M Cube because we have so many innovative researchers and scholars here in attendance. We've gathered today in the name of collaboration and in celebration of the enormous possibilities that arise when talented faculty from the University of Michigan come together to produce scholarship. Like I said, this panel is just one example of our higher potential. We should look for other ways to engage the full spectrum of our expertise and breadth. I can think of numerous community and global problems outside of the biosciences that would benefit from this attention. Public education in disadvantaged areas, sustainable energy, Clear, clean air and water, poverty and income inequality. I could list many, we could all list many more. My question today is who in the world is in a better position to contribute to the solutions of these problems than us, the University of Michigan? After three months meeting with faculty of all stripes and disciplines, I am confident that we have the ambition and the talent to reach a new meta level of our collaborations that will make a difference. I also believe that the mechanics of discovery are heading in a direction that plays in our favor. One might say the arc of discovery is long, but it bends to Ann Arbor. Multidisciplinary approaches are also more attractive in terms of funding, and they have the most potential to make the kind of impact that we should be known for at the university. Finding the answers we seek will take all of our collective intellectual power and our trust in one another to step beyond the traditional ways that our campus has been organized. To be the leaders and best, we must move together to adapt quickly, nimbly, and efficiently. We cannot be 19 separate parts and expect to truly excel in the current ecosystem. We have to be one, and we can be the best one there is. We are the university that can do this and do it best. I look forward to taking on this work with you, my colleagues at the University of Michigan. I hope we can develop strategies that will allow your talents to best flourish, best teach our students, and position the University of Michigan for perpetual excellence. Thank you for your dedication to our students, your passion for discovery, 
and your innovative spirit. It's a pleasure to be here and to be your colleague and to take on these challenges together. Go Blue.